All right, people are piling in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's learning session, Spotlight on Deforestation Fronts, Drivers of, and Solutions to Deforestation Around the World, organized by WWF Forest and Climate. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Emmeline Gasparini, and I'm the Communications Specialist with the Forest and Climate Team in the WWF US office. And our presenters today are Pablo Pacheco and Stefano Zanobi, also from WWF, Nigel Dudley from Equilibrium Research, and Dr. Lisa Rausch from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. And for those of you who have participated in past sessions, this will sound very familiar, but yes, today's presentation is being recorded and you can find the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To get to the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate. You should have two audio options. You can listen through your computer or dialing through the phone number that was provided in your registration email. And it's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening through your computer, those are sometimes caused by having too many browser windows or tabs or programs open at once. So feel free to close some of them, which usually solves the issue, or you're always welcome to join by phone. And if you continue to have technical difficulties, please send me a message via the chat function and I'll try to get you sorted out as quickly as possible. And on that note, questions are absolutely welcome. Uh, you can send your questions at any time using the Q&A function on your screen and we'll answer as many as possible during our allotted time after the presentations. And after the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email with additional forest and climate resources from WWF and our presenters, including a link to the YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of the session. So thank you all again for joining us. And with that, we'll get started. Pablo, I believe you are up first. Uh, thank you, Emmeline, um, for the opportunity to present the main findings of this, our work. Uh, well, let me start saying that um, many studies have already been conducted about uh, deforestation and drivers of deforestation. And as we know, uh, the estimates differ, no? depending on the methods and time frames used, used for the analysis, which uh, makes a bit, uh, the discussion more confusing. The main focus of the study that we are presenting here and that we conducted with WWF is to identify where most deforestation and forest fragmentation has taken place and analyze not only the drivers, but also to take a look at the responses that have been put in place to deal with uh, deforestation. Uh, so this analysis is aimed to understand better the trends, the changes uh, to important global conservation agendas, but also debates about the effectiveness of uh, solutions to deforestation. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, so uh, it's, and it's been recognized by many already that deforestation is a wicked problem because the factors driving forest cover change are multiple and these uh, drivers or factors interact in complex ways and at different scales. Uh, also the way in which these drivers play out across regions tends to differ and the influence that these drivers have on deforestation is not static since uh, changes over time. So taking this on, into consideration, so, so we thought that there is need to identify better the places where most of deforestation occurs to examine the influence of these drivers and their changes over time. But if we want to understand these trends over time, we also should get to know better the potential of the different responses to deal with deforestation and how effective these responses are. So this is not an easy task. So we decided to follow an eclectic approach by building on existing work on deforestation and proposing new analysis, taking the concept of deforestation fronts as central. So these fronts are the places with the largest concentration of deforestation. Next slide. So the framework that we adopted uh, on the one hand, it looks at the drivers, the, the left side of the figure in your screen. On the other hand, are the responses that have been adopted. The drivers, uh, as we know, there's lots of work already on drivers. These are multiple, they are direct, indirect. The direct drivers comprise agriculture, extractive infrastructure. The indirect drivers can be grouped in demographic, technological, political, economic, and environmental. So it's easier to 
uh, to see what's the impact of direct and indirect is a bit more difficult. Also, the responses are multiple. And here in this work, we are offering a taxonomy of responses that looks at six single oriented approaches, as we are calling them, and two integrated approaches. These approaches rely on different groups of responses types. One group is comprised by area-based responses, the ones that set aside areas following some specific goal. And another group are sector or commodity specific responses. Next slide. In our analysis, we have followed four steps. Now, the first step was to produce a global map for forest cover loss and fragmentation dynamics for the period 2000, 2018, drawing on five global data sets. Then we conducted a deforestation hotspot analysis uh, using TerraI annual series from 2004, 2017, with a focus on the tropics and subtropics uh, because of the availability of data. Then the third step was to identify the boundaries of the deforestation fronts based on the outcomes of the deforestation hotspot analysis, which was complemented with expert opinion. And finally, we conducted, we conducted an extensive literature review on these different fronts. Uh, and also we produced one fact sheet for each front that you can uh, find in the report that was produced and released. And next slide. So based on this analysis, we identified 24 deforestation fronts. Nine are in Latin America, eight in Sub-Saharan Africa, and seven in Southeast Asia and Oceania. Uh, so again, uh, these are the places in which there's active deforestation. But this doesn't mean that there's no deforestation outside of these deforestation fronts. Because these fronts comprise over half of the total deforestation in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia and Oceania. So this suggests that there is also deforestation is scattered outside the boundaries of these fronts. These fronts cover about 710 million hectares and half of this area is, is forest. And two thirds of that forest is primary or intact forest. But also uh, I want to reemphasize that this analysis is focused on the tropics and subtropics. So also there is deforestation in the boreal and temperate forest that was not included here. Next slide. The dynam dynamics of these fronts uh, is diverse, you know, uh, as you can see in this, in this figure. Eight of these fronts uh, underwent high deforestation rates, mainly in Latin America and Southeast Asia. 14 experienced medium deforestation rates, including some in Latin America, several in Sub Saharan Africa, and two experienced low deforestation rates. Uh, also, I think it's important to say that uh, about half of the forest, which is contained in these deforestation fronts, has undergone some type of fragmentation. So, uh, which suggests that forest degradation is also very extended in these places. No? Uh, and also, there has been, uh, for these forests also have been affected by, by, by fires, which contributes to further forest degradation that may end up, as we know, in deforestation. So the type table above that you can see in this slide presents some information on forest composition, forest fragmentation, fires, and they went in these different fronts. So I will not describe them because of time constraints, but you can look at them in detail in the report. Next slide. So on the drivers, uh, when we were looking at the different deforestation fronts, we come up with a, a, a way to compare them, which is this table. Uh, that provides some perspective about the different fronts. Also, the cells color in red shows the primary drivers. In orange are the secondary drivers, and in yellow are the less influential drivers. The arrows suggest the main trends of these drivers in the last 15 years, whether they have increased, decreased, or stabilized. So the main trends that we can derive from this analysis uh, are the following. So large-scale commercial agriculture has the largest influence, so we know the importance of, of the influence of pasture expansion for beef production in the Amazon, conversion of forest woodlands, uh, grasslands for soy expansion in Chaco and Cerrado, and oil palm and pulp and paper, no plantations in Southeast Asia. But an in, important trend to highlight is that uh, smallholder engagement in commercial agriculture uh, also tends to translate into growing pressures on forests. And this is all across the board. No Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Mekong, Sumatra, uh, Borneo. Also, it's not a surprise to say that deforestation is more likely to occur in places where there's growing expansion of roads. 
uh, including local roads. Also, uh, forest is being increasingly threatened by uh, pressures from informal mining operations that, as we know, tend to attract people. Uh, but this is growing over time. And finally, I want to stress that logging has declined as a primary driver of forest degradation and loss, but uh, often it precedes forest clearing. Our next slide, please. On the responses, as I was mentioning, we put this um, classification of taxonomy of responses, and you can see six uh, single-oriented uh, approaches that have been evolving over time. No? Uh, from mainly being dri driven by states, but now they are over time involving more stakeholders and um, a different number of non-state actors. And also two integrated approaches, not red, uh, linked to projects and national programs, but also jurisdictional and landscape approaches that also are much more integrated in nature. Also these approaches uh, are comprising what we see as common response options, which are 13 uh, responses, no? including both area-based and sector or commodity-specific, uh, which establish different interactions that you can see. We try to uh, put those in interactions in the figure that's on the right of your screen. Uh, and you can see that some of these uh, responses are place-specific, but others apply to supply chains and financial flows. So, uh, and this is coming from, next slide, please. Analysis of responses that we conducted in these different fronts, uh, trying to come up with an inventory of these responses. So in that table also, we try to provide a global perspective across the fronts. So the ones in dark blue are the ones that have been mainstream in policy frameworks. Uh, the one on uh, turquoise are the ones actively used and expanding. And the ones in light blue are those which are still in a very experimental stage. But what are the main messages that are coming from the analysis of responses? Uh, I think the first obvious one is that these responses have evolved. Uh, I was saying from state, including non-state actors, from national regulations, and they have comprising now a wide range of initiatives, mainly at the subnational level. Um, a few of these have been mainstream, you know, the older ones, including protected areas, land zoning, legality of production, and red, it has been also got a lot of traction across the fronts. Uh, what's important to say is that the area-based responses, no, for example, setting aside protected areas, recognition of indigenous lands, moratoria, have contributed to halt the deforestation in localized places, but they cannot avoid leakage. On the other side, the commodity or sector-specific responses, no, uh, which, for example, include voluntary standards, zero deforestation commitments, payments for environmental services. Uh, we've found that they struggle you know, to reach impact at scale. And that's mainly because of the limited uh, uptake. So, uh, but at the same time, you can see that there's ample potential for solutions you know, at the landscape level, including financing for sustainable landscape, supporting alternative smallholders, livelihoods, et cetera. Different types of partnerships between state and non-state actors. So uh, we can say that progress has been achieved when two or more responses have established reinforcing effects. Uh, but also, as we know, as we have evidenced by some cases, uh, to be effective, these solutions, they have to stick over time because often they tend to change because of policy changes as well. Next slide, please. So on the ways ahead, uh, some of the messages that we will, would like to, to stress by taking this perspective on the fronts, not much uh, actions that can be done beyond those fronts. Uh, I think one important to, one res something important to stress is that uh, there's need more collective action. You know? uh, but also the responses should be tailored to a specific context. Uh, there's much more need to emphasize place-based engagement to build solutions that actively involve local stakeholders. In that sense, also, there's need of more ambitious and inclusive public, uh, private community partnerships that can embrace multiple fronts. And also, it's quite critical to embrace equity in the business models that could help smallholders to build more resilient livelihoods. And another key factor is empowering indigenous peoples and, and local communities. You know? uh, so there's no one size fits, fits all 
approach. So, uh, so there's uh, think something important coming from here is this need to tailor and also to improve this institutional al alignment that also involves connecting more the national to subnational sub -national level action and strategies. So that's all from my side. So now I would like to invite Nigel, who will introduce a bit the agenda for action that's emerging from, from this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo, and hello, everyone. Nice to see some people on the call that I haven't been in touch with for a long time. So to start, this is really quite depressing in some ways. Um, we've been working on addressing deforestation for at least 30 years at quite a high level throughout the world. Not only have we failed to stop that, but in some ways deforestation is getting worse uh, and is accelerating coming into new areas. We clearly need some very new approaches. Next slide, please. Indeed, some of the responses that we put a lot of time into, like forest certification, while very impressive in improving management in many forest areas, have not been significant in stopping forest loss in, in the most critical areas. And one of the surprises for me in this analysis was how little effort in certification there were in any of the sites we were looking at. It's like if there's a, a real problem, if there's a real rush through of deforestation, there hasn't been time to look at certification. So some of the things that we've been relying on don't seem to work here. Next slide. So to just repeat a little bit what Pablo said, we found that area-based responses are the most effective, protected areas, tenure rights for indigenous peoples and local communities, um, moratoria on conversion. They can prevent loss in particular forests, but they don't stop wider deforestation on the whole, and they can displace forest loss elsewhere. Sector-specific responses like certification, deforestation, free supply chains, payments for environmental services. We know they work, but they don't work on anything like the, the, the scale we need. Next slide. And one of the real messages we got from other colleagues working on this was that one of the perverse impacts of forest conservation in some areas has been to push um, the conversion of, of habitats out into grassland and savanna. And in some places, grassland and savanna conversion is actually accelerating beyond that of forests. So if we don't take a whole vegetation, a whole ecosystem view, we, we also um, risk perverse impacts. Next slide. So we clearly need integrated responses rather than individual responses, as Pablo said, results-based payments, jurisdictional landscape approaches, but linked with state policies to imply ensure compliance. It's very clear that voluntary processes on their own don't work on the scale we need. And we also need to look more broadly to tackle things like food system, diet consumption, um, transforming the economic system. Next slide. And in particular, um, responses must tackle food systems. We um, we found that agriculture was the biggest driver of change, both large scale and small scale, and will continue to do so unless we make major changes to not only agriculture, but what we expect from agriculture, and um, particularly the, the amount of, of meat we eat within our diets. Next slide. So I'm gonna run fairly quickly through five general areas and then look specifically at some uh, responses. I'm not going to look at them all. You can look at the slides. I'm going to pick out some of the key things which I think are important. What not to do. We can't keep providing subsidies for unsustainable forms of commercial agriculture. One of the really weird things is that we're still paying for agriculture which is uneconomic, um, unenvironmental, uh, 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 and yet you know, because of vested interests we continue to do so and that continues to drive deforestation. We need to really address unsustainable supply chains. And we need to embed this within a proper understanding of, of human rights abuses and, and human rights within forests. Very clear evidence that when 
local people have control of their forests, the, the loss of forest generally slows, not always, but generally. And so giving people rights is, is important. Next slide. What to do more? So we need to strengthen and expand um, tenure rights for indigenous people and local communities. When they control land, we have a much stronger chance of controlling deforestation. We need much more public monitoring of deforestation. There's been, um, we've, we've got many more tools in our toolbox at the moment. We'll come to this in a moment. But there's many more options for people to monitor, let people know what's happening. Social media can spread those messages out, which you couldn't do in, in, in 10 years ago. And set moratoria with clear targets. We found that the, some of the moratorium that have, have, have been put in place, like the one on clearance and the Cerrado in Brazil, have actually been surprisingly uh, successful. So this is, if we can get agreement on where not to clear, then that would be very important and, uh, and quite successful. Next slide. What to do better? Loads and loads of things we can do better, but three I'm going to choose here. Zero deforestation commitments by companies. Many companies, hundreds of companies, have made zero deforestation commitments. Very few of them have put any flesh on that in terms of clear commitments or actions. So we need to hold them to account. Regulations on importing wood from countries with deforestation. Um, wood and wood and, and products from forests. This is really important because the European Union is currently debating bringing this sort of legislation in. And so putting pressure on them now will make sure we get a strong um, message from a, a, a group that, that brings about a third of the, of the forest products and, and related products in global trade. So that would make a very big difference and targeting certification schemes in priority places. I still believe there's a big role for certification, but we need to make sure we're targeting it. Next slide. What to do differently? Increasing participation in forest planning, bringing people into the process, particularly local people, so they understand why decisions are being made and they have a role in shaping those decisions. Increasing other forms of conservation alongside protected area, particularly ICCAs, indigenous and community conserved areas, and this new form of other effective area-based conservation measures, which are coming in through the um, Convention on Biological Diversity, and avoiding forest protection impacting negatively on other ecosystems. Range of things we need to do differently. And finally, next slide, what new things to do? We've got new technological options. We've got lots of um, automatic ways of recording data now. We can use satellite imagery in a way we couldn't a few years ago. Tracking systems tra attribute, attribute emissions to specific commodities and, and companies. Uh, companies have been able to hide behind um, curtains saying, we don't know where our products come from or, or we can't prove where their products come from. It's becoming much easier to address that now and to really link particular problems with particular companies and again, hold them to account and providing incentives to keep forests standing. Very, very important. Next slide. So finally, I'm gonna look briefly at what we can do within deforestation front countries what we can do in consumer countries and what we need to do globally. Next slide. In deforestation front countries, clearly we need to focus on the most important areas. And we hope this report gives us that kind of information. We need to apply landscape level planning to minimize fragmentation. Fragmentation analysis is one of the new parts of this report and it's, it's really devastating because not only have we lost huge areas, but about half of what is left has been badly fragmented. And that's dangerous in itself, but it's also often a precursor to forest loss. We need to work more closely with indigenous peoples and local communities, the people who have a stake in keeping forests alive. We need to tighten legal frameworks in many countries. Look at restoration opportunities. Of course, we want to keep what is there, but when we've lost forest, we need to look at putting it back. And there is the decade on ecological restoration ongoing at the moment, still starting in June. It's going to be here for a decade and we can work with that. And we need 
within those deforestation front countries, we need to work with upstream suppliers to ensure legality. Next slide. In consumer countries, we need to engage fully with moratoria, with payment from ecosystem services, Red Plus, in order to help countries with deforestation to use those tools. We need to continue with consumer campaigns. People in consumer countries need to know it's still an issue. They need to support through their purchasing policies and elsewhere. We need to lobby for bilateral support to aid to support reduce deforestation and not, for example, to, to fund things which are going to increase deforestation. We need to create a market for sustainable commodities. It's, 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 it's there in all countries, but it could be larger. We need to get people involved in buying to help forests. And we need to establish meaningful partnerships with governments in producer countries. This is not an either or, we need to be working together. Last slide. So global responses. We need to scale up nature-based solutions, including through the sustainable development goals. We need to show that setting aside forests is not just for biodiversity, not just for conservation or the rich, but it has clear um, and demonstrable advantages in terms of climate stabilization, disaster risk reduction, food and water security. We need to lobby for the 30% by 2030, the aim for putting aside 30% of forests into protected or conserved areas in the next decade. To lobby for a target to reduce forest fragmentation in the new framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Include clear forest targets in the revised nationally determined contributions from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That took the, the climate change lobby a long time to really focus on forests as a as a way of reducing carbon. They know that now and we need to work on that. We need to transform the food system. And it's clear that some of the, the largest players in the agribusiness industry realize that now. There's an open door we need to push on it. Integrate approaches through regional bodies and scale up public private finance to forest conservation. So there's a whole range of things we need to do in countries with deforestation outside those countries and, and on a global scale. Uh, I only had time to touch on some of them, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm now gonna pass, I think, to Stefano. Thank you very much, Nigel. And um, yeah, so for the deforestation in France in the Mekong region, we are gonna look at the case study in the central uh, part of Laos, uh, in Cancun district in Bolican Sai province. So in Kambukut district, uh, forest conversion was increasing rapidly. And within the period 2000 to 2018, the forest cover has decreased by 10%. Some of the drivers behind this were the proximity to Vietnam, which created strong market incentives, the expansion of uh, agriculture, in particular of cassava, and other issues that were more localized, such as selective logging, resettlement, and hydropower dam development. Next slide. So WWF set out in uh, uh, 15 years ago uh, with the goal uh, to protect forest and enhance livelihood. The approach uh, that we were promoting was uh, uh, sustainable community-based forest management following a forest stewardship council like FSC standards. Beside FSC certification activities uh, included land use planning, community patrolling, rattan nursery, community organizing, rattan and bamboo handicraft making, and market development. At the time of the field evaluation in 2017, the project that achieved uh, like more than 17,000 hectares of forest uh, endorsed by the government in Bolikam Sai province and in Kampkut district, the study area more than a thousand hectares of uh, forests were endorsed by the government and FSC certified. Next slide. So what did uh, the project achieve in terms of impact uh, on the forest? Well, the project managed to reduce conversion, but not to fully avoid that. We ran an economic analysis uh, which controlled for variables such as accessibility and biophysical characteristics 
And the findings were that um, the project managed to reduce deforestation by 13% in the period between 2000 and 2018. From the field interviews with communities, uh, we know that they recognize the value of FSC into helping them to manage and protect forests, as well as uh, to increase the value added of the work that they put into handicraft making. However, in one of our target villages, uh, our activities were unsuccessful and the forest conversion uh, was still very high because uh, the pressure on land was twice to be managed. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons learned from uh, our study? Well, the statistical model is quite robust, but it also has room for improvement. Data availability, like the one of land use plans, uh, is an important limitation. The more data we have, the better the statistical model would be. Also, unsustainable income generation activities, such as selective logging, which is a driver of deforestation and degradation, can be mitigated by alternative livelihood opportunities, like handicraft making. However, like these opportunities, uh, they need to be sustained in a longer period of time in order to be effective. And in certain contexts, this can actually be a challenge. Also, financial feasibility is quite fundamental. FSC certification provided like an increased income for the angry craft that the communities were doing. And this was able to provide a further incentives to the villagers and the community in to protect the forest. This is my last slide, so let me know if you have any question, and I hand it over to Dr. Lisa. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Lisa Rausch. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am going to present to you about the soy moratorium in the, in Bra the Brazilian Amazon. Brazil's soy moratorium is a sectoral commitment that was implemented in 2006. Under the moratorium, the buyers of nearly all Amazon soy agreed to monitor for and reject purchases of land, of soy grown on land planted after the, the, the cutoff date, which was originally 2006, but has since been changed to 2008. Compliance with the moratorium has been nearly universal. Some factors in the moratorium success included simple rules and straightforward monitoring approach. In other words, there's no planting on land cleared after the cutoff date and the monitoring is, uses um, simply annual satellite-based maps of soy extent overlaid with annual deforestation maps. Um, the, the moratorium also benefits from sector-wide uptake, the short nature of soy supply chains in the Amazon. There are not indirect suppliers in this supply chain. The growers generally sell directly to the traders that implemented the moratorium. And then also the moratorium's alignment with national regulations, um, mainly the forest code. So soy is not, is not and has never been the main immediate driver of Amazon deforestation. Instead, nearly all deforested areas in the Amazon are used for pasture before some of them may later be planted to soy. However, after more than a decade of implementation, our new study shows that beyond, clearing up, but beyond cleaning up the Amazon soy supply chains, the moratorium has also protected Amazon forests, resulting in over 1.8 million hectares of avoided deforestation since 2006, um, leading to a reduction of, 30, of deforestation by 35%. This is because the moratorium has reduced the potential future profitability of deforesting new areas since the potential for them to later be used for soy has been taken away. While there are often concerns that the moratorium has led to leakage into Brazil's Tejado or perhaps to other locations in Latin America, we did not find evidence of leakage into the Tejado in a recent study um, that we published um, in Nature Food, um, and our finding is also supported by our research in the field. Next slide. There are opportunities to improve and expand the success of the moratorium. First, the scope of the moratorium could be expanded to cover non-soy portions of soy farms, for example. Second, soy-driven deforestation continues to be a, minor, a major challenge in the Sahado, and a similar policy is needed there. However, the policy and supply chain realities um, in the Sahado make replicating the success of the moratorium there much more challenging. And finally, the moratorium is under political pressure in Brazil, with some saying that it violates Brazil's national sovereignty since most of the companies that have implemented the moratorium are international. 
However, investors, international companies, and consumer companies have expressed strong support for the moratorium, sometimes as a condition for continued business. Moreover, many, very few Amazon soy farms can clear legally, so the cost of the moratorium to farmers um, is actually very low. Um, continued expressions of support for the moratorium from key stakeholders um, is important for the moratorium to remain effective and in place. Thank you. Wow, thank you all so much. And can I just especially say thank you to the presenters for holding their time limits so faithfully um, that we have quite a lot of time for questions from participants. So fantastic job. Thank you all for that. Let me just open up the Q&A screen. Um, this first question we have is uh, primarily for Pablo. And then if other presenters would like to weigh in after he's finished, please feel free to do so. Um, Pablo, how do you suggest working with stakeholders in and near the areas with deforestation and nature-based solutions? Can you give a good example of successful benefit sharing in a nature-based solution approach? Well, I think all these new approach of nature-based solutions uh, may comprise uh, different type of, of actions. Well, as we know, nature-based solutions, by definition, they should be solutions that are uh, aim to target societal challenges. And one of those is climate, but also food security. And they contribute something in, uh, additional to what has been doing and comprise protection, sustainable management and restoration. Uh, but I think there are quite important ways in which natural, natural nature-based solutions can be amplified and accelerated on my mind, one of those is, uh, for example, uh, expanding recognitions of tenure rights to indigenous people and communities around areas in which there are still unclear rights. So in my mind, that's one first step if we want to secure nature-based solutions in those landscapes in which there are contested claims on land and other resources. I think also, in my view, in areas that could be a risk in which smallholders are depending for their livelihoods on forest, uh, I think it's quite important thinking on help smallholders to build alternative livelihoods. I know that is easy to say, but I think much more efforts have to be done on uh, diversifying the sources of, of income and livelihoods for, for those local people. And, and that's strongly connected with the need to mobilize resources. I think as part of the debate on nature-based solutions, there's going to be a huge opportunity to mobilize resources, but those resources have to go to these right places and to the right people. And probably those are the places in which those resources have, have to be channeled. That's what comes to my mind. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Pablo. Any other panelists want to weigh in before we move to the next question? No, fantastic. Um, this one is another question for Pablo, uh, but I'm sure, actually I know that other people will have an opinion about this one. Um, deforestation is a serious issue in developing countries because people highly depend on forests for their livelihoods, for food, um, for water, for all of the ecosystem services that we know um, we need forests for. Um, even with introducing Red Plus, the result is you know, a, not good, maybe due to the long process. Um, so how do we stop deforestation effectively in developing countries? And this, I, know, yeah, I think that, th one. thanks for that question. And I think we that's a question which is at the center of the work that we have done. Because yes, we acknowledge that um, deforestation is, uh, it grows because it's still converting forests to mainly agricultural uses. Also helps to reduce rural poverty as we saw with palm oil in Indonesia, may stimulate economic growth, uh, but also we have the problem that these benefits may be captured by some groups uh, or, or elites. And there are also quite important issues about distribution of benefits. So what we are suggesting in this analysis is that there is not a, as we were saying, a, a single 
uh, silver bullet approach. And that's why we need, uh, and I think REF has helped to do that, but also all the debate about jurisdictional approaches, it really, they need to combine different type of responses. And something that has come clearly from the analysis is that the responses in isolation are not going to work. No, uh, and there's need of more uh, partnerships uh, that involves public sector, private sector communities. And we have, been see we have seen that in cases in which deforestation has slowed down. I think the Brazilian example, when uh, deforestation slowed down from a peak on 2004 to 2012, was a good example about how a combination of measures can reduce deforestation. But also we have not to forget the role of markets that they play in that process. And at the same time, I think looking at the Indonesian case now, how uh, the different efforts that are being put in place, not just for, from the government with the moratorium, with the plans on restoring peatlands, but also efforts from companies are, uh, I think they translate uh, in, in a bit of reduction of, of, of deforestation in some places. So I think it's looking at what's this combination of measures in these places. You know, that could be uh, redirecting incentives, uh, improving uh, partnerships within the public and private sector on specific places. They start working with smallholders to improve their practices, etc. cetera. Uh, but also as one of the questions is mentioned in, in those cases, you may need much more additional resources. And yes, and probably there's not a single source from those resources are going to come from, but multiple sources, but also there are some other measures that are more, uh, that may not need much resources to be put in place as these more uh, political agreements among uh, policy makers and stakeholders, but uh, I would stop there. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, Stefano, Lisa, Nigel, would any of you like to weigh in on that big weighty question before we move uh, to the well, next yeah. one? Maybe briefly, Emmeline. Um, Nigel here. I think the other thing to point out is that in many cases, uh, certainly in Latin America and in um, Asia and Oceania, the bulk of clearance is not being done by local people. It's being done by large scale agriculture, by um, other forces and local people are often losing out. So it's not as if they're the drivers, um, they're actually suffering alongside the environment. So they're natural partners there. It's slightly different in Africa where much of the clearance is still for small scale agriculture and people trying to make a living and then the, the, the issue needs different types of responses. But I think that's an important distinction to make. Thank you. Um, I know this question has been written, uh, received a written answer, but I think it deserves a bit more um, of a response and I, and I think other people can weigh in. Um, but a lot of these you know, approaches that we are referencing here require resources um, and resources are, are always sort of seemingly in short supply in this particular area of work. Um, where are these funds to come from? And it would be great, um, Stefano and Lisa, if you could chime in um, on, on your particular cases and how funding has impacted the, um, the effectiveness or, or whether it's been relevant for the cases that you were discussing today. Um, I can start. Well, the project was started by WF, um, the sources of funding in the beginning was uh, uh, the EU and it eventually started uh, to get uh, to other international donors. The project was able to generate revenues for the, uh, for the communities which were also used for, uh, for certain activities. Uh, depending on their uh, on the community's needs. However, that thing came actually quite late in time and after a considerable investment. Yes, I think that's uh, that's pretty much what I can share from uh, from his study. Lisa. 
Sure. Um, in the case of the soy moratorium, the, you know, the, I guess the, the real functional costs of the program are related to monitoring and the, um, the soybean traders that implemented the moratorium are large international corporations for the most part. And so they have borne the costs of, of the, um, of the monitoring. Um, I think another thing that people then bring up is just sort of the opportunity costs that, you know, soybean growers in Brazil are bearing by having to comply with this, this agreement. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's an, another question that's just being discussed a lot in Brazil right now, especially as they look to expand the moratorium or not, I mean, implement a similar commitment, I would, I should say in the Sahado is, um, you know, people are going to be asked to forego a lot more clearing in the Sahado than they've been asked to forego in the Amazon versus the, the national um, the national legislation. And so, you know, I think that's, I think that's one of the big questions that still has to be answered is who's going to help, help um, bear those costs. Thank you. Nigel, I wasn't sure if you wanted to weigh in on this. I know you answered a bit um, in a written answer, but Sure, you yeah, have more to say. Bit. Okay, a little bit more, Emily. Um, it, it is a key question. There is money around. Um, there's been, and, and more private finance coming in. There have been some really impressive efforts to raise money for individual countries to work, um, develop trust funds, and so on. So uh, we, can, we can do that. But I, I also think it's not purely a matter of money in many cases. It's getting the buying policies right, getting the mix of legislation, um, support from companies, support from local communities. So it's not, you do need money. You usually need money to get people in place to help drive the process or support the process. But it's, um, there's very few times when we can outcompete something like a palm oil company in terms of a direct alternative. I've looked at lots of the efforts to provide you know, different alternatives to, to using forests to say just clearing it for palm oil. And actually, if you look at short term economics, it never works out long term. Of course, it does. But that's a different issue in a way people don't often look. So so there's got to be a mixture of, of um, policy legislation support and, and other things. And um, funding is a big part of that, but um, not the only part. I'm sorry, that's not, there is no easy answer either. That's, that's also clear. No, of course. I think that's uh, something that we have learned quite a bit through this series and through our work that there isn't an easy answer. And that's one of the reasons why um, it requires so much expertise to, to make progress um, and to achieve the goals that we're, we're all working towards, which is, you know, resilient, healthy forests. Um, Payment for ecosystem services has been suggested as a good approach to reduce deforestation, um, but in places where you don't necessarily have a partner in the government, are there other catalysts that can help PES systems um, be established, be successful? Um, Pablo, I don't know if you want to start with this one. Yeah, I think, well, the, the whole debate about payment for environmental services. I, I think there has been multiple pilots and initiatives around payments for environmental services. Uh, I think the whole debate has been on additionality, how much additional the resources uh, invested on pay, paying for services provided, how much uh, additionality there has been. Uh, but uh, even though I think also you see cases, mainly in Latin America, you know, where uh, states have been embraced compensations that went beyond projects. You know? I think we have cases in Ecuador, in Peru, in Mexico, that I think they, well, in Costa Rica, that they have worked well to uh, change the incentives that farmers may have to protect uh, some of the forest, uh, but still there have been questions of additionality. You know? so, so how much additional those payments have been in protecting forests. Uh, but I think in spite of that, we, I think clearly we can say that 
payments for environmental services when they have been adopted at that scope, they have really contributed, no? Probably with this trade-off, no? That in some cases there may not have been additionality, but clearly they may be, they are targeting resources for people that are in need of those resources. So I think we have to keep trying with, uh, with that type of, of schemes and complementing with that, let's say, of course. Thank you. Um, one element uh, that is, is sort of present throughout the presentation, um, that it, but I don't think we've, we've really touched on specifically, is restoration of forests. Um, could, could you weigh in on perhaps how much effort is put into forest restoration and why um, it can be such uh, an important but a large undertaking? I think Pablo, if you want to start us off, and then other people can join in. Yeah, I think it was the bias of the study not to look in at restoration and just to focus on on deforestation. But clearly, we see that there are places in which deforestation and restoration are coexisting. For example, I cannot think of any place in the Amazon where you can see in a landscape in which there's deforestation and there's not some type of restoration. I think there's need to do more work on looking at those uh, dynamics simultaneously in these places, for, which is the same thing in, in the Mekong, for example. So, uh, what is more difficult is try to see what are the connections between the deforestation that there's one place and, and, and restoration, and what's the sort of incentives that are leading also to, to restoring forests. You may see that, for example, in the Amazon, there has been uh, a lot of uh, forest regrowth that is also associated with changes on agricultural practices. You know, farmers live in areas in which they cannot mechanize to forest regrowth, so say there's some kind of uh, regrowth on those areas and studies they have been suggesting that there's more forest regrowth in the Amazon than the one that we uh, that was estimated before. Well that's just to say that we were not putting any specific focus on restoration uh, on, in this study but we uh, see that there's uh, a need and there's to connect not analysis on deforestation with analysis of uh, restoration on these landscapes because they may be connected. However, at a global scale, we know that there's a bit of disconnect where we have deforestation and where we have restoration, or where much of restoration it takes place on, on, on the temperate areas, no? and restoration comes through plantations. No? But uh, just to say that we were not looking specifically at, at restoration, but I think that it's the next uh, sort of questions that we have to ask and the analysis that we have to make. Because deforestation and restoration should not be seen as uh, disconnected topics, as it is often the case now. But Thank probably, you. Stefano, I may want to say something about these connections in, in, in the micro. Yes, absolutely. Stefano, yeah. would you like to yeah, I mean, I can I can share some uh, some thoughts about what's happening in the Mekong. Um, I mean, in general, a, a lot of uh, issues in in the Mekong comes from uh, uh, let's see poor land use planning, and the result after years of poor land use planning is uh, fragmentation and is uh, uh, de degradation and was like kind of soil impoverishment. Um, the economic development is still very limited though. Um, so deforestation is in a way very likely to continue, but that doesn't mean that uh, we should, should leave like uh, uh, all the, the lands that is currently fragmented and unproductive and so on uh, up to itself just because uh, deforestation is still happening. There is definitely the potential of uh, reducing deforestation and uh, restoring the lands that have been degraded in the past. Over. 
Thank you, Stefano. Um, all four of you spoke in your presentations about communities, um, different types of communities and how they are or should be more involved in, um, in these efforts. I'm wondering if we can go in the same order in which you presented and if you can each um, elaborate just a little bit more on either the role that communities have played or should be playing um, in the particular part of our presentation that you were addressing. Um, and then maybe one obstacle that you see to that being, um, being enacted. So Paula, if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Yeah, if I can say, um, when you look at specific cases or, um, on, the, on the tropics, you see how important has been the role of communities, indigenous peoples and local communities on protecting forests and avoiding deforestation. Also, you see how slow has been the process of recognizing rights to indigenous people and local communities. Uh, there has been a very strong political effort in Latin America of indigenous groups to get rights recognized and not just indigenous groups, but also Caboclo's uh, traditional communities, rubber tappers, if you remember all the movement that was around Acre, how a traditional rubber tappers could get rights to, to those to those forests. So I think there has been a very contested political movement to get rights or for indigenous people and local communities to get rights. Has been slow. Studies are suggesting that there's still an important gap in recognition of those rights, which is the the the, the initial condition. You no, know, if you want uh, or indigenous peoples and local communities are going to play a stronger role. There's need for keep uh, expanding recognition of those rights, but also another problem, uh, there are two associated problems with that, which one is, uh, is still how to reduce the threats on those indigenous and local community lands, even though in cases in which there are rights that have been acquired, there are threats, and we see cases in, in the Amazon and in some other contexts as well. So it's hope to reduce those threats, but also how to put in place uh, mechanisms through which land conflict can be negotiated. Uh, so I think there's still a lot that can be done. But also we know that recognizing rights to indigenous people and local communities is not enough to realize those rights. So there's a uh, need to keep advancing in the agenda of really recognizing the full rights, not just the tenure, but also economic and political rights. I'm sorry that I spoke too much. No, thank you, Pablo. Nigel, you want to join in? Yeah, um, thank you. I think w one of the key challenges is ways to bring those people into the debate, particularly working more closely with conservation organizations. We have very similar aims in many cases, people living in forests and, and forest con and, and organizations involved in forest conservation, we sometimes end up butting heads, pushing against each other rather than pulling in the, in the right direction. So there's a lot in the same direction. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of building those links, bringing them into the international policy debate um, and, and so on. I think, I think the danger is, although I said several times in my talk, that um, indigenous people and local communities generally have a, have been shown to have a strong role in in protecting forests. That can also break down sometimes. It's not it's not perfect. And some of the places where communities have given have been given back control in the forests, it's actually ended up with an increase in, in forest loss, often because uh, institutions are not strong enough to prevent a few powerful people, families grabbing hold of the resource and, and exploiting it. So it's not a it's not a cure-all, it's not a perfect solution. And generally that kind of bottom-up process works best when there's also a strong legislative frame to provide an overall umbrella. Uh, so we need to get that interaction right. And I think we're a long way from it yet in many cases. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Stefano, did you want to weigh in? 
Yeah, I mean, if we can add something based on the Mekong experience, uh, I completely agree with what Nigel and Pablo said. I would add that uh, um, one of the tricky um, parts of working with communities is that uh, they are all different. And often you don't have the doesn't sound right to say, but the right community in the right place. And that requires uh, quite a lot of uh, efforts and quite a lot of investments. And generally speaking, like communities are always like very fragmented from one another. So the question of scales with communities, uh, to me, it's still like a, a question mark. Um, and I haven't seen like uh, uh work with different communities reaching the right scale uh as was mentioned like this fragmentation and these uh, very high level of differences between one community to another it makes like you know this the issues of scale extremely complex and uh solutions i think are still needed for that over thank you stefano lisa do you want to have the last word Sure, I'll quickly weigh in. I mean, in, you know, different than some of the other um, the community issues mentioned um, by by everyone else. You know, in the case of the soy moratorium, um, you know, you have the, the 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 soy grower community, you know, who are being asked to make uh, changes to their behavior, and then you know, the most um, influential community um, in this process currently, I would say, is is international companies, investors, consumer countries that. Um, can show support for zero deforestation approaches and supply chains and um, and and lead conversations about how to um, ensure that those those approaches are are implemented. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, good reminders that uh, communities are not monoliths, and um, we need to be sure that we're approaching them in their appropriate context. Yes. Um, so thank you all. We've come to the end of our time today. Um, and I would really like to thank our presenters for sharing their expertise with our community and thank the participants for joining us and sending in your really thoughtful and engaging questions. You will all receive a follow-up email in a few hours with some additional resources that are specific to this webinar. And I do want to thank the presenters again for giving us so much time to have the Q&A session. Um, it's always lovely to be able to really dive into these topics um, and engage with people, even if we don't get to speak um, naturally as we would in a conversation. If you would like to revisit this webinar in the future or share it with colleagues, the recording will be up on the Forest and Climate YouTube channel in about a day or so. And you can also find recordings of previous sessions there for additional enrichment. So thank you all again for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful day.